Amen. All right, so um, it looks like I'm going to have to uh, take back everything I said in the first service. I got a lot of stuff wrong. Um, But luckily, you're in the second service, so you'll reap the benefits of that. Uh, But seriously, today we're going to talk about um, this passage in John chapter 15. You know, in all the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, it's really really hard to find a more powerful passage. Um, You know, back uh, back in high school, I... I was in a, in a high school play, and uh, you probably don't know that I, I was a, a class clown and a practical joker and that sort of thing. I know that's hard for you to imagine, some of you. But uh, when I was in high school, I decided that, that I would uh, change the lines. In fact, change my role in, in the school play. And so there were like 30 of us in this play, and uh, everybody had a different role, and I was playing the dad of somebody, and this other girl was playing my daughter. And so here I am, I'm dressed up in a three-piece suit with shiny black shoes, my hair slicked straight, black, straight back with gel, and I'm looking slick, and I'm looking old and mature and serious. And here comes this girl, and she comes up to me, and her line is, Daddy, it's so good to see you. It's been so long. And she reaches out for a hug, and I say, not long enough, and walk away. <laughs> and then she doesn't know what to do next, Right. And then the other actors, they don't know what to do next. So now they're making stuff up like, "Uh, Daddy, sorry about whatever you're mad about. Let's continue the play, please. Okay, so so they're trying to make up for lost ground. And uh, the, the balcony, you know, they figured out this whole thing is a ruse. And so they've erupted in laughter, everybody from kindergarten to fourth grade and all the high schoolers and junior high as well. But there's one guy who's not real happy about things, and that's the director of that play. (laughs) So he comes up to the stage, and he takes his fists, and he bangs it down, he says, you do it again, Farley, and you do it right. And you know, from there, really, the play went went off without a hitch. (laughs) Yeah. But I I tell you this true story to tell you, I mean, when we're in the theater of life, we got to know our role. We got to know who we are. We got to know our lines. We got to take our proper place or otherwise everything else gets thrown off. And in John chapter 15, we're going to find out what our role is. You know, if we in the Christian life get our role wrong, we end up trying to bear the weight of the world on our shoulders, trying to be fruit producers, trying to be fruit creators, and then later on we try to be fruit inspectors. Well, we're going to see in John 15 that that's not our role at all, and so we need to find our proper place. Number one, Jesus Christ says that he's the true vine. He's saying, I'm the vine, and you are not. (laughs) You are not the vine. You are not the source You are not the producer of this fruit, so don't freak out about the fruit. Your fruit bearing is my problem, he might say. And so he says, I'm the true vine, and then he says, my father is the vine dresser. Now, what that says to me is that, you know, sometimes we get confused about the Trinity, like, oh my gosh, there's Father, then there's Son, then there's Holy Spirit, like, how does all this work? Who do I pray to? Who do I talk to? Who lives in me? What roles do they play? This whole thing can become a ball of confusion. I remember being a young Christian, kind of just thinking, I mean, you know, what's my role? Okay, I've heard a good bit about grace, but what do I do? You know, where's my connection? How do works happen? And a lot of these questions, if you've wrestled with some of these questions, I I hope that they'll be answered today through God's word about this connection that we have with Christ. So first of all, we're seeing that Jesus, Jesus Christ is the source, Number two, we're seeing that God the Father is the caretaker. He's the one who's the vine dresser, the caretaker. He's saying, you know what? I began this good work. I'm going to oversee it. I'm going to make sure it's carried on to completion. But when we get into this passage today, let me just forewarn you, a preview of coming attractions. I mean, there's going to be some verses that people take out of context. People uh, end up preaching fear and guilt and anxiety Because, oh my gosh, am I producing enough fruit? Maybe I'm going to be cut off. Maybe I'm going to be thrown away. Maybe I'm going to be burned up as a branch. And without a proper context and seeing what my role is in this passage and who I am as a child of God, then this whole thing could go crazy on us. And so 
right now, maybe there's a doppelganger church somewhere. You know what a doppelganger church is. I mean, maybe they're on the other side of the planet right now. There's an identical sort of church over there. And they might be telling us that, you know, you got to work hard to abide and you got to work hard to bear fruit and you got to work hard or else you'll be disposed of. And I've heard that taught with this passage. And so this morning, we're going to be looking at some words, some very important words that need proper understanding for us to arrive at what? At the truth that sets us always, it sets us free. It doesn't put us in bondage and fear. And so he says, Jesus says, I'm the vine, I'm the source, I'm the resource, I am your everything, and you are not. That's number one. Then in verse two, he says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. Well, that sounds really good, but uh, wait a minute, if he takes it away, how does it bear fruit? I mean, that doesn't make any sense. For him to just take a branch and take it away, away from the vine, it can't bear fruit. So something's up there. Wait a minute. Also, prunes. What do you think of when you see the verb prunes? Normally, I think of the clippers, man. He's getting out the clippers. And ooh, you're not a very good-looking child of God. Snip. Ooh, you've disappointed me lately. Where's your fruit? Snip. And all of a sudden, we've got these branches laying on the ground, right? And we're, we're looking up to heaven, God, please don't clip me. Please don't clip me. Look, I'm just a little twig. Give me time. Give me time, Lord. And uh, you ever feel like just a twig, you know? It's just like a bad Monday and you're feeling twiggy. Oh, my gosh. But, but this passage, I think when we get into the meat of it, when we get into the definition of terms, you use a resource like Strong's Concordance, you look at Vine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words, you actually end up with an equal choice. It's a 50-50 opportunity to look at these phrases. It either says he takes away or he lifts up. It also says, either it says he prunes or he cleans. Now I'm going to give you, speaking of previews of coming attractions, let me just give you a little glance, a little uh, glimpse of, of verse 3. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Now let's go back to verse 2. Again, notice that the choice is he prunes or he cleans. Now it's a 50-50 option, but in context, man... I'm thinking, let's go with cleans, because he just followed up that thought with you are already clean, not you are already pruned, because of the word which I have spoken to you. So let's get into vine dressing. We're going to have a little workshop this morning. Uh, we're in the vineyard. Imagine us now. We're in the vineyard, and I'm the vine dresser. Now, what would I do with, what would any vine dresser do with a, a branch off of the vine that's now kind of keeled over. You know what I'm talking about. It's lost its strength. It's lost its sustenance. It's lost its life. It's lost light. It's lost food. Like the sun is, is food to this plant, right? But this plant has ended up face down. I mean, the leaves are down in the mud, down in the dirt, and the water has come, and now it's all muddied. And you can just imagine this hideous sight of these branches getting no life, getting no food, getting no light. So what does the vine dresser do? Well, you know that what really happens is they have these trellises, right? They have these structures, these long rods that stick in the ground. Some of them have branches coming out the sides. So they reach down and they take this plant and they actually attach it to the support structure. They lift it up. They lift it up and they tie it. They connect it so that the branches that were once down on the ground away from the light are now facing up high where they can get the sunlight coming in. Photosynthesis can take place. And there's food exchange happening here. And there's life given to this plant because of it. And so now with that in mind, look at what Jesus is saying. Of course, Jerusalem is filled with Vineyards and vine dressers, this is an analogy that people understand freely and easily. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he lifts up. And every branch that bears fruit, what does he do? He cleans it off. That's what they do. They come by and they clean the branches in this vineyard so that what? With the dirt and the grime removed, there can be even more photosynthesis, more light, more food happening for this plant. So he takes the one that's not bearing fruit and he helps it out in a major way. 
And then he takes the one that is bearing fruit and he says, bear even more fruit. And so it really takes on a whole new life when we see that God is not snipping people off of the branch of Jesus every time we blow it or every time we you know, mess up and don't feel that we're producing enough fruit. And so then he says, and remember that he is speaking to his disciples first and foremost, and everything else for us is like a trickle-down effect. We're in the body of Christ. But he's addressing his disciples here, and he says to them, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. In other words, don't hang around waiting for me to clean you. I want you to know I've given you a vineyard analogy I've given you this picture, this word picture, this parable, if you will. But don't don't misunderstand me in thinking that you need to be made more clean or something. What I'm telling you is that my father is like a vine dresser and he cares cares deeply for you. He cares about every leaf, every branch, every twig, okay? Every part of this vineyard. And so he takes great care with it as he lifts it up and he cleans it and he ties it so that more sunlight can be enjoyed. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. Now, there are churches throughout United States history and even beyond the United States. There are many churches over the last few, well, last few centuries, last two centuries really that I can think of, that got into a a tradition or a movement that we might call the abiding life, we might call the deeper life, we might call the victorious life, we might call life on the higher plane. We could think of all kinds of titles for these movements that are sort of flowing in the same stream together. And if we don't watch it, sometimes in these movements and even outside of them, the word abide can be largely misunderstood. The word abide can seem like something so lofty And so far off that how can I possibly attain to it? Only the spiritual elite are truly those who abide in Christ. And so the pastor might say, go this week and seek to abide. And everybody's going, did you abide this week? Did you abide? I I felt like I was abiding on Tuesday, but Wednesday was a disaster. (laughs) And so... We're searching for this deeper thing, this higher life, this deeper plane, this better life where we finally learned to abide. And guys, when we get to the end of what we're going to see today, I mean, basically, it's going to become obvious that the word abide means live and that we do live in Christ, that everyone who is in Christ as a believer lives in Christ. It is a position, a place It is spiritual geography. I've likened it to this this property that we call church without religion. You know, we have this building. um, We have the coffee area back there and some books available. Then I've also made these facilities over here available to you this morning. There's a men's and a women's both. You're welcome. And over here, there's some classrooms. And then across the sidewalk over here, we've got the lodge. This is where Stephen's uh, Bible study class took place this morning at 930. And so we have a lot of stuff going on. We have a lot of resources here. It might take you a while to get to know the many aspects of our property. But right now, you are in Church Without Religion. You're not getting in. You're not trying to be in. Looking at your neighbor, are you abiding in? No, no, no. We all know we're in. We're in. We're in. We're in. And so verse 4 here, let's put it in context. It is before the cross. It is before the resurrection. It is before Pentecost. It is before the indwelling of Jesus Christ in every believer. And so the disciples are taking notes, sitting on a rock somewhere in Jerusalem. They're listening to Jesus give this description of life in Christ, and they're taking notes, and they don't fully get it yet. But he's saying, look, live in me, and I in you. Now, do you think Jesus is trying really hard to live in you? No, he either lives in you or he doesn't, right? Either you have the Spirit of Christ or you don't. He lives in you or you don't. It's the same thing with you living in him. You either live in him or you don't. There's no halfway. I'm not 82% abiding. 
I didn't abide at 3 o'clock and lose it at 4 o'clock. And so while there is a growing in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, just like we get to know this building and this property, while there is a growing in the knowledge and growing in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we are fully in and we abide in him forever. Can I get an amen? Amen. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. What is that saying? If you're not in him, good luck. I mean, you can have really good looking stuff, but it's filthy rags if you're not in him. If you don't have life in him and he's not in you. So this is a black and white passage. It's all or nothing. It's a description of uh, really a prophecy, a foreshadowing, a foretelling a preview of these coming attractions at Pentecost that one day I will be living in every believer and anyone who rejects me will not see life, will not see life in me. And so apart from me, you can do nothing. And so he says, I am the vine, you are the branches, he who lives in me and I in him, he bears much fruit for apart from me, you can do nothing. So let's think about this. I mean, we live in Cottonville, right? I mean, there's a lot of cotton around this part of the world. You ever go out late at night, you know, you get out there around 1, I recommend 1.30 a.m. The traffic has ceased. It's pretty dark. It's pretty quiet. There's no distractions. And if you stand out there in the middle of that cotton field, you can hear that cotton going, growing, right? <laughs> I mean, you can hear the effort, the noise of that cotton trying its best to come up out of the ground and grow, right? Of course not, right? What are we, what are we saying here? I mean, there's, there's, there's sun and there's moisture in the ground and from above, we hope. And with the perfect formula of moisture, man, this cotton crop can flourish, right? And it happens the way God designed it to happen, not through effort, but through soaking in What God has provided. That's what Jesus is saying here. You think, I mean, he he said it about the birds. He said it about the trees. He said it about the lilies of the field. He said it in so many ways in nature. Like, look, this thing runs. This thing is a well-oiled machine that I've designed from the ground up to run. And then you're going to tell me that your life is different? That your life is different from every natural analogy around you? No, no, I'm the creator, you're just the creation. Let's find your proper role in the theater of life. And when you find your proper role, yeah, it might be an assault on your ego for a bit of time, but pretty much in the end, it's a big relief. A big relief that I found my proper role as the creation, not the creator. I am not bearing the world on my shoulders. My growth is... And my bearing of fruit is your problem, Jesus Christ. My bearing of fruit is your problem, and so I'm letting it be your problem. It's up to you. And so we see then, he's saying, I'm the vine, you're just the branch. Play your proper role. If you live in me and I live in you, then you bear much fruit. But apart from me, forget it. And this is what the Apostle Paul was saying, basically. I mean, when you read Paul, he is saying... um, Man, I, I, uh, I got acquainted with my weakness. And then, then later he's saying, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm bragging about my weakness now. I mean, I went from getting to know my weakness and being acquainted with it to, to actually bragging about my weakness. So what he's saying is, I learned to define the word nothing. <laughs> the word nothing is really meaning a lot to me now. Apart from me, you can do nothing. See, I used to think God was just going to help me. Right? That's not the Christian life. The Christian life is not God helping me. It's not my 60 and his 40. (laughs) It's not my 70 and his 30. It's not God helping me. So I might have been praying prayers like, Lord, please help me. Please help me. And sure, there's a spirit behind that and an intention and God sees our heart. We're not picking at words, but just get this. Just see this. That God's desire in all of this is not to help. God's desire is to be our everything. Big difference. God is not looking to help. It is not my strength plus his strength. 
It is not my well-adjustedness, my well-adjusted Christian character plus Jesus coming in to help that or empower that. It is all of him. And so Christ wants to be my everything. Now, you say, wait a minute, Farley, you preached a sermon. It wasn't too long ago. And I remember when you said, it's not all of him and none of me. Remember, you're not a hollow tube. It's not all of him and none of you. Yeah, you're a branch and you've got an identity. You're a child of God. You're you're designed for branch life. He has not excluded you. He is not a branchless vine. There are branches, and each one of us is a branch. And so there is a role for us, and God has decided to do it with us, in us, and through us. He didn't have to. We could just be some passive audience with God on stage and no role to play. But instead, he's given us a role. And there's a privilege in that, and there's a place in that. God is not intimidated by our existence. God is not looking at us as an obstacle, but as an instrument. And so he says, I'm the vine, but you are something. You're the branch. Apart from me, you can do nothing. All right, now here we get into some troublesome language. Um, You know, in the earlier service, I told them they could lose their salvation, but I've changed my mind in the last half hour. Yeah, good stuff, huh? You're getting the greater revelation. All right, just kidding for the 17 visitors or whatever. Just kidding. If anyone does not abide in me, now we go back to our definition of abide. What does it mean? Try really hard? No, it means live. If anyone does not live in me, what happens? He's thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Do you see why this false idea that abiding is an effort on our part to continually maintain and sustain the presence of Christ? That's how it's been taught, that abiding is sustaining and maintaining and practicing the presence so that the presence stays. And if you don't abide and you don't sustain and you don't maintain, then the presence of Christ leaves and Well, if all that were true, if that were the meaning of abide, then we'd all have been burned up weeks, months, years ago, right? But the reality is, is that this is speaking of people who do not live in Christ, who have rejected the gospel. And there are many passages throughout the Bible that talk about the destiny of that person. And it's not pretty. But we submit to what is here because we're not crafting, we're not crafting our own ideas and crafting our own theology to our liking. We're submitting to God's ways and we're basically saying, God, you judge the world. I'm no judge. God, I submit to your ways. Your ways are not my ways. And thank you that your ways just happen to be living in me and living through me and being my everything because I need you real bad. If you live in me, And my words live in you. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Man, that sounds awesome. Hang on just a minute. A million dollars in my right hand right now, Lord, please. Man, that that is a crock. It did not work for me. Has anybody ever tried? I mean, I'm serious. We're we're, we're joking around here, but I mean, I am dead serious. All it takes is five minutes on YouTube, and you can find people teaching That sort of thing, can't you? Now, the reality is, is that in context here, we're finding that God's command, God's will, God's desire, all of this is all about love. As as you keep reading, you find that God's command is to love others even as I have loved you. And keep this in context, too, that it's been written to the disciples, first and foremost. And we can see many fulfillments of this verse in that they asked things in Jesus' name. If I go overseas and represent the United States, I'm as an ambassador, I'm acting in, in the name of the United States. But if I go rogue, if I go indie, if I decide to craft my own plan for the peace of worlds, of nations all across the world, then I've gone rogue, I've gone indie. I'm not representing the United States any longer. And so... There are other passages similar to this that talk about asking in Jesus' name. This means asking according to his heart, asking according to his spirit, asking according to his life. And in context here, we see really 
we see really that what's on God's heart is love. Loving others even as God has loved us. So if you live in me and my words live in you, well, what does that mean? Are the words about, you know, Lamborghinis and mansions and millions and millions of dollars appearing on the front lawn? No, the words of Jesus abiding in us, they bring a whole different definition of what is meaningful to ask for. I don't know about you, but after the flesh, I mean, I want to ask for lots of things. I want to ask for better circumstances, a pain-free life. And, you know, as I get older and experience more trouble now and then, I go through stuff, I start to realize that, uh, you know, maybe what I'm asking for is not really what my dad would pick out for me. Maybe what I'm asking for is not really the best. It's my definition of best. And so I pray these prayers, and I'm like, God, why didn't you show up and give me what I wanted? And is it because he's unloving or because he doesn't, doesn't come through on his promises or he falls short, he fails me, he's not a good dad? Or is it that his, he's just on a different plane, like he's on a different playing field? He's got a totally different mentality for what, what works for me, what's best for me? Because maybe I don't even know me. <laughs> maybe I think I know me, but all I know is the current state of me. All I feel and all I experience is the current state of me. But there's a me at the deepest level that only God knows. And God, it's like God is revealing to me over time. He is revealing to me who, who I already am. I don't need to become someone, but I don't know who I am. And so over time, he's revealing to me that, hey, you thought this was wisdom, but that's worldly wisdom. This is wisdom. Hey, you thought this was fulfillment, but that's worldly fulfillment. This is true fulfillment. And over time, these words, these Sunday morning words, they start to become Wednesday afternoon life to me. They become every day. They become something of substance. And, and, and so I'm, I'm, I'm learning about the person that I already am. You're already the branch, right? He's already the vine. But this connection with Christ, this is an unfolding revelation for all of us as we get our, our thoughts renewed, right? If you live in me and my words live in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit. So, man, I thought, uh, I thought this was about me. And, you know, I mean, how I'm doing, that's what we think. That's what religion programs us to think. This whole thing is about me and how I'm doing. And the most tantalizing thought that will ever come to you is a thought about you and your status and your progress and your performance and your okayness. And, like, if the enemy wanted to consume you with any tantalizing distraction, it would be about you, right? I mean, who do you enjoy thinking the most about. Yeah, yeah, I mean, come on, you, you can say it, I mean, or I'll say it for you. I mean, who is it that we enjoy thinking about the most? And the answer would be us. So then, what is the enemy going to do? The enemy is going to bring in the tantalizing distraction of self-improvement, self-assessment, fruit inspection of oneself, and it's all about whether I'm getting enough glory to feel okay about me, or I'm getting enough glory to be okay in God's eyes. And he's basically trying to say, look, I already took care of you. You're okay, man. You're righteous. You're holy. You're blameless. I made you okay so that this could glorify me. This is not about you. The fruit bearing that you do honors the vine, not the branch. Now, let's not kid ourselves. Uh, let's define fruit for just a second. Because here we are in the Bible Belt, and there's lots of definitions of fruit out there, right? I mean, some people think fruit is witnessing. Do you notice that witnessing is not one of the fruit of the Spirit? I dare you to find a dozen verses about witnessing in the whole New Testament. I mean, door-to-door -door witnessing, I dare you to find two. I mean, witnessing is not the fruit of the Spirit. Now, talking about Jesus, it's what we're doing. It's what will come natural as we celebrate him. I'm not bashing that. I love that. I'm just saying that's not the core 
of what the Spirit is producing at the fundamental level. The fruit of the Spirit is not witnessing. Did you notice the fruit of the Spirit is not church attendance? Now, I'm not trying to get you to not come back next week. <laughs> Y'all are nice people, and, you know, we, I'd like to see you now and then. But the fruit of the Spirit is not church attendance. The fruit of the Spirit is not Bible study. Did you notice that? Bible study's great. It's what we're doing this morning. We got the Word of God right up there on the screen. I love it. There's no, no message without it, but that's not the fruit of the Spirit. So if the fruit of the Spirit is not witnessing and Bible study and church attendance, then what is it? Now, this is, this is beautiful. I mean, the fruit of the Spirit is for my benefit and the benefit of other people. Watch this. The fruit of the Spirit is joy. Who's experiencing that joy? You are. Would you rather have joy or lack of contentment? I'd take joy. I just choose door A. Joy sounds good. <laughs> All right. Patience. Would you rather just be eaten up inside with impatience, burning up inside at every little issue, the traffic light, the order that's late? The, or would you rather have patience welling up inside of you? Again, I'll take patience any day. Peace. Would you rather have peace or just religious anxiety and emotional anxiety all day long? You see, who's the fruit of the Spirit for? Okay, wait a minute, though. There's love. Now, would you rather experience the love of God or not? And then I've got an overflow to other people so that it starts benefiting people. I mean, let's ask you, would you rather be around somebody that's got peace or somebody that's got anxiety? <laughs> Would you rather be around somebody that's uh, got joy or they're totally miserable? Uh, yeah, hey, one person agrees with me. and <laughs> I mean, we're going to hang out, but forget these losers. <laughs> they can go off and be miserable. But you hear what I'm saying? The, the Bible Belt definition of fruit, where we measure ourselves, assess ourselves, and become fruit inspectors about three or four activities. Oh, how much churching did you do? How much studying did you do? How much witnessing did you do? And then we rank ourselves and all that business. We have missed the point of bearing fruit. Bearing fruit is I've come that you, that you, that you might have life and have it to the full. Right? A full life in Jesus Christ. The number one person who benefits from bearing fruit is you. The number two and three and five is everybody else around you. But first and foremost, I need to see that fruit bearing is not some religious hoop to jump through. It is Jesus being my everything. All right. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. This morning, this slip of paper right here, it, uh, it proved to be a sheet of paper when I wrote on it. I'm telling you. I mean, it soaked up the ink just like it was supposed to. It didn't smear or smudge. Everything's good. I can tell you, this proved to be a piece of paper this morning. Now, did that paper exert effort? No, of course not. It's just serving the role that God intended it to have or that man intended. And so you see that what really this is saying is that as the vine dresser does the vine dressing and as the vine does what the vine does, then what happens? As a result, the branch proves to be a branch. And because of the fruit bearing, we prove to be his disciples. So again, who is this about? It's about God proving that everything he set up to operate truly operates because Jesus works. Jesus really works. So it's a shame. I mean, I know what we're looking for. After the flesh, we look at a passage like this. Okay, God, yeah, yeah, I'm really going to prove it. I'm really going to prove it this time, God. This week, I promise. I know last week was a total bomb. But let me tell you, I mean, there was some bad stuff that happened Tuesday. I had a bad hair day. Wednesday, you know, the place was a mess. The kid, he was misbehaving. But this week, ah, it's probably going to be different, God. I'm going to prove that I'm your disciple. And then we get into the deep voice of the disciple is like level seven, right? Oh, I was a believer, but now I'm a disciple, right? 
And so there are people that say this. I mean, there are people that say, oh, it's great that you're, you've heard it. Yeah, they, they say it's great that you're a child of God, but are you a disciple, right? And that's like, they, you need to be like me. You need to get up on my level, right? Well, what this is saying is, this will prove that you are a person that learns of me and that leans on me and lets me be your everything because the only way to bear fruit is from me. Don't try to live for me, live from me. Big difference. So living for Jesus, trying to live for Jesus is a dead end street. Living from Jesus is a never ending adventure. Huge difference. Are you willing to live from Jesus and not try your best to live for him? Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Live in my love. So, you know, there's people, I I know folks who've been abused, I mean, since they were young. Maybe they got abused three and five times. My wife and I were talking about somebody in Canada who, you know, may have grown up with a lot of abuse in their life. And I mean, when you're abused by authority figures, parents, people that have misrepresented love to you, it's really hard to feel loved. And what I take away from this is, hey, if you've ever misunderstood love, uh, look at how God feels about his only begotten son. Look at how God feels about Jesus and the same quantity and the same quality of love that they enjoy That's the love that he's extended to you and me. And so don't mistake it. Don't label a love from a parent as how God loves you, as great as that love may be or as horrible as it may be. Don't look at parent love, authority love, people love, and try to figure out God's love. Instead, look at the love that exists between God and his own son. Look at at the love within the Trinity. That's what it's saying. I mean, the Trinity is a gathering. <laughs> the Trinity is a gathering of three people. The Trinity is a, is a picture of fellowship. The Trinity is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and a deep love relationship there that we can hardly fathom, but we know it's perfect. Now, take that perfect love and say, that's the same love that they love me with. And then try to go teach, oh, you can lose your salvation. Oh, God turned his back on you. Oh, this, oh, that. It doesn't make any sense in light of the Trinity quality of love that God is exuding toward us. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. We're going to finish up. It says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. All right, everybody go home and I guess throw the shrimp out of the freezer. And, uh, you know, we're going to have to Start policing everybody Saturday morning. Make sure you're not out mowing. If you keep my commandments, what does this mean? It's not the 613 commands of Judaism. It's not the law. In fact, here, as you keep looking at this passage, this chapter, and then the John, the author of this, I mean, John in 1 John also talks about his commands. And again, we get back to love. So, so it's kind of circular. Watch this now. If you're, if you're listening carefully, I hope that you'll see the circular reasoning. This is, in a good way, this is spiritual circular reasoning. What goes around comes around. So if you keep my commands, which is love others. That, wait, that could be for me. <laughs> if, you, if you keep my commands, if you keep my commandments, which, by the way, are love others even... As I have loved you, then you will abide in my love. Okay, well, what does that have to do with abiding in my love? Well, I just told you to love others even as I've loved you. So how are you going to do that? you got to know how I've loved you. Yeah, i I got to go. <laughs> um, yeah, and we don't have to go into mute buttons or anything like that. We'll just, we'll just love. Uh, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Well, what's his command? Love others even as I have loved you. So so how how am I going to... I mean, are you serious at this point? I mean, can you believe it? I mean, okay. I mean, I was surprised by that one, you know, (laughs) because I've seen a lot. But nevertheless, just love, just love. All right. Just love. Love. All right. Are y'all feeling that love? 
Yeah, because it's flowing. It's flowing. All right. If you keep my commands, you'll abide in my love. Well, what is the love? Uh, the love is the love the, w- the way that Jesus loves. So how am I going to love you the way that Jesus loves me unless I know how Jesus loves me? So I got to soak in something. I got to bathe in something. I got to bask in something. I mean, I've got to soak, absorb something before this whole thing can even happen. And it is a circular thing. All right. I wake up every day and love others even as he has loved me. How do I do that? By looking at how he's loved me. So this command is pretty amazing, really. I mean, this command is, hey, refocus on my love. Hey, refocus on my love. And from that, you'll love others. Just as I have kept my Father's commands and abide in His love. So you can see, I mean, this is not something that we're earning or working for. It's basically saying, do what Jesus did in in the dependency sense. These things, we'll finish with this verse. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. All right, so... So what did we see today? I mean, first of all, Jesus is the source. He's the vine. God is the caretaker. God's the vine dresser. He's got this whole thing rigged to be about Jesus. When you wake up and you're in the theater of life, don't play the wrong role. Don't try to be the vine. Don't try to be the vine dresser. Don't try to be the fruit inspector. Be the branch. Heck, be the twig. I don't care. Just be in the proper place of dependency, right? And so what we're seeing here is kind of the culmination of it all. The culmination of it all is this. This whole thing is so that you can have spiritual fun. (laughs) I mean, do you see that? That Christians should be having fun? Now, I know, I know, I changed the word. I changed the word joy to fun because joy we become numb to. We kind of forget. We sing it in our songs. We read it in our Bibles. And we kind of forget what joy is. But joy is, you know, having a lot of fun with God, enjoying Him. I don't mean that all our circumstances are rosy, but I mean getting pure pleasure out of knowing the God of the universe. That knowing Jesus Christ is the funnest spiritual thing We can ever experience because Christ is our joy. So next time you think about fruit, don't think about a measuring stick. Don't think about church attendance and Bible study and witnessing and these activities that we've labeled as the epitome of spiritual experience. Instead, think about fruit being when Jesus Christ lives in me, giving me peace. When Jesus Christ lives in me, giving me spiritual fun because he is my joy. That's the goal. Now, that's what people are attracted to. People are attracted to peace and joy. They want to be in a family, not in an army. They want to be in a family where there's peace and joy and genuine love from a heartfelt motive that's not fake. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for today. We just thank you for um, the chance to to get together again and be reminded of who you are and who we are and play our proper role. We don't have the world, the weight of the world on our shoulders. We are not the, those who impact. We are not world changers. We are not world impactors. We are not the vine. We are simply the branch. Father, we thank you for this revelation. It might be that assault to our ego for a time, but ultimately it is the grand relief that we need to know that you are our everything. Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you that he is our source, our resource, our life. He is not merely our helper. He is indeed our everything. In Jesus' name, amen. How he saved me, how he raised me, how he feels.
one of the most powerful scriptures from the Gospels, John 15, which is God's proclamation that I'm not just going to be your, your guide and your helper and your counselor, but I'm going to be your life. At the core of your being, I caused you to die, and I caused you to awaken the next day. You awoken, you've awoken with my spirit living in you. There's a reason that happened. It's not so that you can go out and try your best. I could have given you a certificate and a place to be in the future called heaven, but I gave you this infused life, this injected life that is Jesus Christ himself so that he could be the vine and you could be the branch. And what a relief that is that my fruit bearing is his problem. That's something to celebrate, isn't it? Now I got to go. I've got a voicemail.